but okay, like, what do you want to talk about? Um, he was like, yeah, um, so look, you know, you and I, we've grown up together. You know, we've been friends since we were kids. And, you know, like, um, you've, like, you've just been around a lot. And I really see a lot of potential in you. And I really see a lot that you can become so much as a person, right? And I was like, oh, thanks. You know, like, that's nice. <laughs> but I didn't know where I was going with this. Uh, but he keeps, he keeps going. He says, but, you know, Ethan, um, you know, I, I've, the friends that you and I have, the people that we hang out around, I just don't see, I just don't want you to waste the potential that you have. And I was like, what do you mean? And then he tells me, you know, like the friends that we, we hang around, like whether at school or outside of school or wherever we meet them, whether at parties or whether at, um, you know, hangouts or whatever, I just feel like they're not doing anything with their lives. And I feel like that, you know, they're wasting the, t the potential that they have, you know. And, you know, I might not be as close to them, but I am close to you. And, you know, I just... I want you to start thinking about your future because I really feel like you have the potential to be so great. You know, it's like do really something do do something really special with your life. And I was like, hmm. Like it, I was really intrigued by it, right? Because who who calls who calls someone else to like a Chick-fil-A to talk about their future, right? Like it just it doesn't happen. Like that's not common, right? But I was I was just like so like intrigued by it because I, I I didn't really think much of it at first, because like, okay, like thanks for the thanks for the heads up, you know, like thanks for the kind words, you know, I'll, I'll keep it in mind. But as I left that Chick Fil A and as I, you know, like went about my day to day, like it really stuck out to me. I started to like think about it more and more, and I decided to look into the Bible to see what this could mean, right? In terms of potential, in terms of like um, our story, in terms of you know running our race per se. Okay, uh, so today that's what I want to talk about today. Three important things that I've learned when it comes to running our race. Okay, if you could pull up my title for today, that's not my title. This is the title. The title for my sermon today is trailing. Can everyone say trailing? <laughs> trailing. Okay, so yeah, three important keys that I've learned when I took a deep dive into the Bible to see what I could learn about running our race. Okay, um, the first thing that I learned, the biggest thing that popped out to me right away about running our race is that there is no race. Can everyone say, there is no race? There is no race. There, oh, there is no race. There has never been a race, at least not the one that you're thinking about right now, okay? Because when we think about a race, we think about a competition where everyone starts at the same point and, you know, ready, set, go, and everyone runs and tries to be first, right? But when it comes to running the kind of race we're running, the race of life, the, the walk with God that we take, it's not a competition, okay? It's not a race. There, you aren't being timed. There isn't a punishment if you win. There isn't a prize if you're first. The kind of race that we run, when it talks about the race in the Bible, it's a marathon. Can everyone say marathon? Okay? This is a marathon we're running. It is a lifelong journey of walking with God every single day, okay? And today, we're going to take a look at one person's unique race, unique marathon that God set for him, and his name is Paul. Can everyone say Paul? Paul. Paul. Okay, now, of course, uh, before Paul was named Paul, his name was originally Saul, right? Now, before, he, you know, he became one of the most influential apostles that we know and love today who converted millions of people to Jesus, he was first a killer, a Christian killer. Um, and... You know, he, his, story, we, his story starts in the book of Acts, okay, Acts chapter 7. Uh, th this is where he was first mentioned um, in the Bible. And as you read from then on, you'll see that he hated Christians. This, this guy, Saul, he despised them. He not only hated them, he wanted to arrest them, he wanted to uh, convict them, put them in jail, and even kill them. You know, he went so far as to make hundreds of miles a journey to go get them and arrest them, okay? Um, and that's what he did. So um, as you read later on in the story, uh, Saul, he calls up the, uh, the officials from the city of Damascus. Can everyone say Damascus? Damascus is a city that's far away from him. He's starting in Jerusalem, and he wants to go to Damascus. And he's, he calls, not calls them, but he sends a letter to them. He says, hey, um, I really hate Christians, and I really want to arrest them. So if, with your cooperation, can I round up some Christians from your city and bring them back to Jerusalem to convict them? and put him in jail. And they were like, okay, sure. So he makes the journey, and the journey is 150 miles, okay? Now, they didn't have cars back then, right? With a car, that's probably like three hours, four hours, right, if you drive fast. But 
for, like, for someone who's walking on foot, for someone on a horse, that's like days, weeks. That's a long journey just to arrest some people who aren't even bothering you, right? But he was so zealous, he was so enthusiastic about killing all these Christians and arresting them that he made that journey. And when he makes this journey, <clears throat> when he makes this journey, he suddenly has an encounter with Jesus. It's beautiful, you know. Um, oh my God, excuse me. He has this beautiful encounter with Jesus. He's, you know, he's on the road, he's on, the, he's on this horse, and all of a sudden there's a bright light that shines on him, right? There's a light that shines, and he's blinded by this light. And then he hears Jesus call out to him. He says, he says Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, right? And they have, this, they have this interaction, they have this conversation, and afterwards he's blinded, okay? He's blinded for three days, and he can't, and then he can't uh, move, he can't see, he's stuck, okay? Now, um, going back to what we talked about earlier, this is not a race. There, this is not time. There's no punishment if we lose, right? Now, let's think about it, right? In a race, we all start the same point, right? You, well, usually all people start the same point, and then they run, right? Now, if, this, if our walk with Jesus was a race, like a regular race, regular race, um, if we were to take someone like Paul someone who was converted when he was, been, when he was already like 30, 40 years old compared to someone like the Pharisees, like a religious teacher who's been studying the, the Bible, the, whole, the law of Moses since birth, he would have been cooked, right, in terms of like distance, right, because he had so much ground to make up because he was so old when he got converted, right? Me personally, I would have been cooked myself. I grew up in church, you know, I'm a I, you know, I've grown up in a Christian household, but I didn't care about Jesus until I was like 18, 19, right? And for some of you guys, you probably have something similar. You probably share something similar with me, right? But I think the beautiful thing about our walk with God is that it doesn't matter where we start, okay? It doesn't matter where we, be, we, begun, we begin our walk with God because as soon as we accept Jesus, as soon as we accepted our Savior, we won our race, Amen. We won our salvation. Well, we didn't win salvation. We were granted, we were gifted salvation through the blood of Jesus. So there is no race. The only, the race begins after we've won, which is winning salvation. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's the first thing, right? The first thing about running our race is that there is no race. Okay. And the second thing we want, uh, we have to, we can learn today about our race is that we need to ignore the spectators. Can everyone say, ignore the spectators? Ignore the spectators. Now, in races or, you know, like any type of competition, you know, there's always going to be people watching from the sidelines, right? People sitting, they want to watch the game, watch the race, whatever, right? Now, you know, you have like the super fans who are so excited to be there, and you also have those people who are called hecklers, right? People who like to talk trash from the sidelines, try to throw you off your game right? Now, it's either that or, like, you know, they start to, like, try to throw you off your game by, like, you know, whispering about false rumors about you or try to, you know, uh, gather your attention, like, try to, like, throw you off your game, right? Now, Paul, he experienced plenty of that when he became Christian, okay? So, if we can pull up um, Acts chapter 9, verses 19 to 21, this is right after um, he had his encounter with Jesus, okay? So, if we can read this all together on three, one, two, three. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? They asked. And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? You know, as you read the rest of the chapter, it talks more about how when Paul arrived in Jerusalem, he had a lot of doubters. He had a lot of people complain about him, you know, because, uh, you know, like when he, they, were, they were so scared to like, you know, be even close to him or meet him because, you know, of all the horrible stories they heard about this guy. You know, like, isn't this the same guy who like, you know, arrested all these Christians who killed all these people who believed in Jesus? It's terrifying. I don't want to be near him, you know. It's, it, it's. Sorry. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like, it's terrifying, you know? And then beside, on top of that, there were also people 
who, you know, want to, like, debate him, like, who are doubting him, who are like, I don't think you, you're genuine. I don't, you know, I don't think that you really believe in Jesus. So they talk about it, they debate about it, and they realize that he was actually serious. Paul, Saul actually had a lot of authenticity, had a lot of honesty when it came to his preaching. When he debated people, like, trying to prove, trying to prove that Jesus was real, Jesus was the way, his, his authority and the way he preached, the way he uh, talked on stage was so powerful, you know, and, you know, you read the rest of the story, you'll see plenty of, you'll, you'll see plenty of stories, plenty of examples of Paul um, having doubters, having complainers in his life, you know, and for me personally, right, I've had some complaints of my own, right, when I, when, when we talk about running our walk with God, taking my own personal journey with God, you know, I've had people come up to, either come up to me or, like, talk about me behind closed doors, you know, whether it's like doubting my ability as like a friend, whether it's like doubting my ability as, you know, a boyfriend, doubting my ability as a Christian, or doubting my ability as a leader, you know. Um, I, the kind of complaints that I've heard, the kind of heckling that I've experienced is nothing compared to Paul, but I've had some complaints myself, you know, and it bothered me for some time, you know, because like, you know, me, like, I'm just a humble guy. I try my best to, you know, serve the best I can, and love people the way Jesus loved them. So to hear people talk about me and to hear people say these mean things about me behind closed doors, like, it hurts my feelings, you know? Because it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I try to be honest. I'm trying to do right. Why are people giving me so much, like, a slack about it, you know? And I'm sure that Paul thought the same thing. But, you know, the thing about Paul that inspired me so much when I was looking through his story again was that he didn't let the noise bother him, Right? He didn't let the noise bother him. He continued to serve and follow, obey God faithfully no matter what, no matter what people said about him. And how did he do it? It's because he remembered one important thing, okay? And this is something that I really want you guys to pay attention to. The thing that he always practiced and reminded himself is that, you know, the people who were shouting, who were screaming from the sidelines, that was just it. They were screaming and shouting from the sidelines, watching him follow God faithfully, watching him obey the purpose and the calling that God called him to, right? And well, how can we apply that to us today? When we have people talk about us, when we have people say these mean things about us, or even like come up to us and try to like press us to our face, just remember, there, whoever does that, all those people shouting at you, that's just it. All they can do is shout and scream and say all these mean things because they're watching you. You are the person that's obeying God faithfully. You are the one that's following the calling that God has called you to, you know? They can't see the vision that God gave you. They can't see the purpose that God called you to. So don't let the noise bother you, okay? If you ever had to choose one person to listen to whose opinions mattered to the most, choose God. God's opinion about you, God's um, words that he says about you, his words are the only words that matter at the end of the day, okay? So those are the first two things, right? The first key things we want to remember when it comes to running our race is first, that there is no race. It's a marathon. The second, that we have to ignore the spectators, ignore the outside noise. And the third thing is that you must keep walking. Can everyone say it with me? You must keep walking. There will be times when the journey gets tough, when the marathon gets tiring, when the walk becomes like sluggish, right? Impossible even, right? Whether it's like we didn't get into the school we wanted to get into for high school or for college, or whether, you know, our relationship with our parents at home becomes strained, becomes tense, you know, when it's like not peaceful at home, or sometimes money just seems harder to come by every single day when it comes to paying off bills, paying off rent, or anything like that. Sometimes it's gonna, it can lead us to think that this journey might be too much, right? That this might be too much to handle, that being a Christian is too hard for me, you know? And Paul, Paul knew exactly how that felt, that kind of despair, that kind of discouragement and disappointment, you know? Compared to other people in the Bible, I would make the argument that Paul had one of the hardest lives ever to have lived. This guy went through it, you know? If, if you pull up to... If, we, if you read in 2 Corinthians 11, um, he talks about all the things that he's faced, you know. He's been to prison multiple times. He's been shipwrecked multiple times, been left at sea. Um, he's been whipped countless times. He even got stoned, which is like some people throwing rocks at you until you literally die from all the head trauma. And 
being beaten, being, um, you know, robbed, everything. This guy went through it, you know. This guy has experienced so much trauma and so much pain. Paul could never live a normal life even if he tried to anymore at this point, you know. And sometimes that might be scary, following God, accepting God, and trying to obey him faithfully, you know. But something else that I learned about Paul was that if you can pull up uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 17, this is something that he wrote uh, to Timothy, which was like his, you know, like you can call him like his, li- his little bro, like his, like, you know, his disciple, the guy like he really cared about, tried to like mentor. Um, and this is what he said to Timothy. And I really want, I want us to read all this together, okay? If you can read on three, one, two, three. But you, Timothy... You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. These are cities. But the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and imposters will flourish. They will deceive others and will let themselves be deceived. Next slide. Nice. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Amen. You know, I've never been one to complain about my personal life, you know, uh, believe it or not. You know, I've always been the type to try to thug out my issues, right? Try to, you know, thug it out and, like, you know, work work through it, and then I talk about it after it's solved, after it's passed, right? Uh, But today, I want to share a fear that I've, that's been growing inside of me recently. Um, you know, I talked about earlier um, the conversation I had with a friend about my future, right? About like, you know, like, he pretty much asked me, like, what are you going to do with your life after college, right? Because it's my last year. I'm in my senior year of college. I'm going to graduate next year, right? And, you know, when he asked me that, I didn't really have an answer for him. You know, I, I didn't really know what to say. Like, I was like, oh, like, thanks for the reminder. But I didn't have a clear-cut answer as, like, what I'm going to do, you know? And, you know, I started, after that conversation, the days and the weeks and the months that passed by after, I started to think about it more and more, you know, because my plan originally, you know, I was, I went to, I went to school planning to be a therapist, right? I wanted to be either like a high school counselor or I wanted to be a marriage counselor. I wanted to be some sort of therapist, right? Because I felt, you know, I'm pretty good at that. I do that for my friends, my family, like I probably could do that, right? But after like a little, like I did like a little thing at my school's hospital where I acted as a mini therapist for patients. And I realized that that's not for me. I can't do it, right? I, it wasn't for me. I don't think this is where God was calling me to anymore, right? Um, so, you know, just like that, in the snap of a finger, like my, my entire life plans were just like crushed, like irrelevant, you know? And I didn't really think about it that much, but until I had that conversation with my friend, it came back up. And I started to, you know, get a little anxious about what I wanted to do with my life, you know, because, you know, I'm in a relationship, right? And eventually, after I graduate college, I'm going to have to start thinking farther down the line, right? Like, you know, getting married, buying a house, starting a family. Like, it's not that close, but it's not that far either, you know? You know, you know the saying, right? Days are short, but I mean, days are long, but the years are short, right? I started to get worried because... I don't know what, how I'm going to afford all that. I don't know what I'm going to do, you know. I, I, I had a plan, but it's all gone, you know. And this fear has been festering inside of me and, like, like making me anxious, you know. Like, I, I get worried. I, sometimes, like, it even just, like, stresses me out so much that I just, like, shut down internally, you know. I get worried. Um, but, you know, when I, when I took a dive into the story of Paul, you know, to figure out what God want, wants to uh, tell me today, when it comes to this, when it comes to, you know, my future, when it comes to what I should do with my life, you know, um, this is, 
this is the, re- this is the, the most important thing that Paul's story taught me that I want to share with you guys today. You know, Paul has suffered, right? Obviously, we, we just read about it, right? Paul has suffered, he has hurt, and he did all of this without even meeting Jesus, right? Because Paul, his encounter with Jesus was not like a physical body Jesus, but it was Jesus from heaven. It was the voice of Jesus, the light, the glory of Jesus instead, you know? He did all this for someone he couldn't even see, for someone he didn't even like know like and, and ate with and hung out with, you know? And if he could do all that, if he had all that faith, all that courage, all that tenacity and endurance to keep going, I should do the same thing. I should keep trying. I should endure too. I should keep walking. Take every day, take every, every step every single day, you know? And for anyone out here, for anyone out there who, you know, when, it com- when you're struggling with anxiety, when you're struggling with fear, whether it's about your future, whether it's about um, your relationships, whether it's about, you know, what God wants to do with you, like what you're supposed to do on, th- on this earth, you know, all I want to say is that while, while you're praying about it, while you're trying to figure it out, all I can say to you right now, the best thing, one of the best things you can do right now is just keep walking. Just keep taking step after step after step. Because every step you take with the Lord will not be in vain. Every step you take with the Lord is not, is not useless. It's, it's not like it's irrelevant. No, every step you take with the Lord is purposeful. And when you have God walking with you side by side, I promise you good things will come. It will come around. You know, and if, if I could call the worship team back up, um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, this. So if you could pull up 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. This is the last set of verses that we're going to read for today. And I want you guys all to read this together because this, if, if, you, if you weren't paying attention at all this entire sermon, this, I need you to lock in for this one because this is my main point for today, okay? If you, go, if you guys read this with me one more time, one, two, three. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes up to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. And encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind. Where did everyone go? (laughs) On three. Hold on, on three. One, two, three. But But you you should should keep a clear mind in every situation. situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering for God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to this. This. Amen. Um, <clears throat> this whole time we've been talking about running our race, talking about taking, you know, taking our walk, our journey with God, and how sometimes we can be discouraged, right? Sometimes we can feel like, you know, like, God, like, where am I going with this? Like, where, what am I doing? Like, I'm just, I'm, I've been praying about it. I've been trying to read my Bible. I've been trying to do the right things, reach out to community. But, like, nothing's working. Like, why is this walk so hard? Why is my day-to-day filled with stress, filled with anxiety, filled with um, heartbreak, filled with discouragement? Why is, why is it so hard, right? Why, why can't it be easy, God? Now, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot, you know, uh, and when I read this verse, 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, um, it really stuck out to me, you know, um, especially six to, verses 6 to 8, right? It says here, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. Um, in case I didn't say it yet, this was the last letter that Paul ever wrote, right? 
when it comes to like the chronological order of things, this was the last one. Because when he was writing this to Timothy, he was in prison for the second time, which was the last time. And then after this, he was killed by the king. He was killed for believing in God, and he was actually beheaded, right? Now, I'm going to continue, right? The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. Now, now the prize awaits me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to this. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. That's what really stuck out to me out of this entire set of verses. Because Paul was truly someone, the definition of somebody who finished strong, right? Somebody who persevered, somebody who endured, someone who, who gave his entire life, literally, to serve God and to obey God and to follow him faithfully, you know? And this prize that he's talking about, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return, in case it's not clear, this prize, this crown of righteousness is Jesus. And thankfully, this prize that we're literally our entire lives are supposed to be for, like, like running for, how grateful are we today that we didn't have to run at all? We don't have to chase Jesus. We didn't have to f work for him. We didn't have to, like, you know, like, kill ourselves for him. When, like, what did I say earlier today? When we accepted Jesus into our lives, when we accepted his love and declared him as a Lord and Savior, we won the race already. The race that we're walking, every step we take is a walk, a step of victory. Every step we take is a step of victory, of conquering evil. Jesus is the prize. And we've already won. Everyone that's accepted Jesus, everyone that's sitting here today, if you've accepted Jesus, you won the race. 